Good morning, everybody. Does anybody know what's in 17 days? Easter. Well, that's a good guess. Uh, I love sometimes being able to tell the camera crew what to do. You need to pan out a little bit. What's in? Keep going. Pan out. Pan. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> keep going. Get up higher. Keep. Yes. What's in 17 days? Good Friday. In 17 days, it is Good Friday. In 19 days, 17, 18, 19, it is Easter Sunday morning. You can't get to Easter unless you go through Good Friday. We intentionally put the cross on the platform today because it fits with the message, but it's also a really important part of us being ready to think through the season that we find ourselves in the Christian calendar, high church, liturgy, uh, liturgy, it's really important to think about Lent, the 40 days of preparation to where all of a sudden we are now in Holy Week in two weeks and we're prepared for what Christ did for all of humanity. Uh, what I love about liturgy and the Christian calendar is we never just show up one day and all of a sudden are supposed to be excited about Easter. There's a preparation for it. There's a processing, thinking, and wrestling with what has Christ done for me? What has Christ done for you? What has Christ done for us? So we're going to jump back into the university passage, but before we do, I got to give you a couple fast uh, heads up announcements because that's kind of what campus pastors do sometimes because I don't want you to miss out on anything. So Easter is the most important, Good Friday is the most important, but you got to know about year-end surprise chapel too, you know, it's kind of in there, right? So if you are wondering where it's at, because we've gotten this question, it is on Friday, March 26th. Did I get the date right, Jeff? Oh, it's April. Wow, when did, where did, where did March go? All right, it's April 26th on a Friday, and the good news is, guess what? Chapel will be over a week earlier, and it's for no credit. Just show up and celebrate and blow off some steam and get ready for finals. You'll be set. Also, something that's coming up, a week from today is Outdoor Kaleo, and we have a bunch of people. Yeah, I love it too. It's fun to be outside. No rain, please. No rain. Uh, we're going to do baptisms afterwards, and we have a bunch of people that have signed up to be baptized. We have some that are just curious and are asking questions about baptism and are choosing to go home and be baptized in their local church with their families and their pastors and churches. If our office can be a support to you for making a public statement, that's what I love about baptism. Baptism is I'm going public. I'm not embarrassed to be associated with Jesus. I'm not just a fan. I'm a follower, and baptism is that moment that you're basically saying to all your friends and everybody around them all in. If you're interested, there's sign-ups up at the front. I got to do this real quick too because this is the last university passage of the year. We have done eight chapels on the university passage and I say should say plural passages because we've been in Isaiah 53 for fall and we are now in Philippians chapter 2. On Isaiah 53, it really, really shaped this backdrop that's behind me. Isaiah 53 is all about Christ coming to this world, that God served up his only son. And in serving up his only son, the backdrop behind me is kind of symbolic of a world taken over by brokenness and sin and evil, that Christ was the answer for that. Listen to a little bit of Isaiah 53. Surely he, who's the he? Jesus. Surely he was born for our iniquities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him with uh, stricken and looked down upon by others and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment of us all. It's great symbolism and great language for the future of what Christ would do on the cross. But today, in the very last university passage of the year, we did four in fall, four in spring. I just got to cheer for a couple people really quick before we jump into what's the most important important part of Philippians 2. Uh, there is someone by the name of Pastor Janet. There's someone by the name of Jeff Spencer. There is someone by the name of Bryn. There's someone by the name of Nelson. And then there are five grad interns that everything that you see this year from videos to artwork to sermon slides, I have never preached alone. And with media services, they have done so much to try to visually as well as scripturally in every way possible get the gospel of Jesus Christ to come alive. So they're going to be so mad 
mad at me, but it would almost be wrong if I didn't do this. I think Janet and Jeff are in this room and some grad interns. Will you just have them stand? Come on, just thank you for reading. Come on, I know you're mad at me. Get up, come on, Jeff, come on. All right. Uh, what, one time somebody asked me, why, why do you have so many slides and so many uh, students involved and why do you do videos? I'm like, haven't you figured it out? I'm not that good of a preacher. I mean, if I can do all these other things, it all works out, right? Uh, the honest truth is this. I think the gospel should be presented in a wide range of ways by a wide range of different people's perspectives. And one of my favorite gifts about being a part of APU is what I call team preaching. So Philippians 2, 1 through 11, in verses 6 through 11, there is what's called the Christ hymn. If any of you are in biblical studies or New Testament studies, you know that there's a couple different spots where we, we have what we believe to be hymns. And another spot of that is Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Now, scholars will argue because there was uh, no uh, Spotify and there was no iTunes or anything else. So we can't prove that these were sung, but they're written in a rhythm and a rhyme where you can imagine in the Greek language that maybe these early congregations sang these songs. And in Philippians chapter uh, 2, verses 6 through 11, we have what's called a Christ hymn. And in it, it gives so much important doctrine. It gives so much important theology. And you could imagine maybe a small group of Christians coming together, going through persecution, wrestling with Rome and all the different complexities of the Greek culture, and reminding themselves as they were singing, who is Christ? What is Christ about? What is Christ not and this theology helped keep them grounded about what it meant to know God. And so one of the creative things that we thought we would do today is we wanted to have three different moments where you would hear this Christ hymn read by, yes, your peers, fellow students. But what's really fun about students reading this passage is that one of our grad interns also wanted to write a spoken word that went along with it. So you will hear a verse and then a little bit of spoken word. You'll hear a verse and a little bit of spoken word. What you see on the screens will be scripture. When there is no words on the screens, it's a spoken word. But we're going to do this three different times this morning because it would make my day if you walked away here and realized how important Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 through 11 are to us as Christ followers. Listen now to the Christ hymn. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He walked among us, teaching us how our lives could be transformed, healing and miracles he performed, but many were not willing to conform yet. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because all of us were lost, redemption is what Christ brought, but the loss of our God's Son is what it cost. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. Jesus Christ, the King. At the right hand of the Father, he reigns. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We sing, sing together, together to, to praise, praise his, his name. name. Amen. Amen. The word of the Lord. Both the scriptures uh, that have been passed on to us, as well as a grad intern that said, what is this saying and how do I put this in spoken word? Uh, I hope each time that it's read, uh, it will really move in you what it means to follow this one named Jesus. 
not just fans of Jesus, but followers of Jesus. I want to read again to you verse 6. It says this, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. On both campuses, and even as you guys have walked around the semester on both east and west, uh, there is a banner up high in chapel, and on that banner it says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Uh, That's the beginning of the Christ hymn. Uh, The very first word in the Christ hymn moves on and it says, who, and then it starts to describe. In that verse 6, it's interesting because there's some key little indicators that are given to us that help us understand this Christ hymn. So it's not just some catchy tune that gets stuck in our heads. It's actually theologically dense that changes and shapes everything that we understand about Christ. And because of that verse 5, everything that we know we've been invited in to follow. Uh, This is about Christ, but because of that verse 5, it's saying this is who Christ wasn't and here's who Christ was. Now have the same mind. That in this hymn, we've been invited to be a part of this same radicalness. There's a Greek word that comes up here. It's harpagmos. 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 And if any of you are Greek theologians and say I said it wrong, you're probably right, but I practiced it, so I think I got it right. And it's the word for exploited. We're we're gonna talk about that a little bit because there's a hint of what Christ is not. But in verse six, it actually gives us some really key information about what Christ was. The one in 6a says this, in the form of, in the form of, You know what word came next? You've heard it read by these amazing students. You know what word it was next? In the form of a human, in the form of a flawed brother, in the form of a rebellious son. Does anybody remember what the word was? In the form of God. Uh, You want to talk about like a radical song. Uh, you know, in the 50s and the 60s when rock and roll and then in the 70s and, you know, got the Rolling Stones and everything else. And you can always imagine there's always been battles between parents and their children about what they should listen to or not listen to, you know. I bet every person in here at some point had some song on their phone that they're like, man, my parents wouldn't like this song if they heard it, right? Uh, imagine the radicalness of this Christ hymn. For the Jewish nation, for Israel, the people of God, in Exodus, they were very clearly said, don't ever try to put God in a form. Don't ever try to make an idol. When you imagine Moses before the burning bush, there was no form. There was just a flame. Uh, God could not be put in a box or put in an idol or have a form. And the radicalness of this hymn is that it basically says God so cared about the world, God so cared about saving humanity, you and me and us, that the way to do it was to take on the form of us. God became human. God allowed Father, Son, Holy Spirit to have another form, to live amongst us, to be an example And if you ever hear this Philippians read in church again, or if you ever read it, know that that verse 6a, in the form of God, it is so radical because it shows the depth of effort, the depth of love that God went to get our attention. Not just human, but fully human and fully God and without sin. And in some ways, we get to see the example of what God's love is like. During the season of Lent, and we would get ready for uh, Good Friday, and we get ready for Easter Sunday. I love reading through the Gospels. You guys are going to have a Thursday and Friday off before uh, Easter. Sometimes I love to tell students, pick up the, your Bibles and read Mark. It's the shortest of the four Gospels, and read it from beginning to end. You could probably do it in 45 minutes to an hour. And before you show up to Easter Sunday morning, Be reminded of who Christ Jesus was, the Son of God, fully human, fully God, without sin, how God lived amongst us. 
Listen to a little bit more about that uh, Greek word I said. Um, I'm going to read three different versions of this uh, verse 6. And at the end of each of the versions, there's a word highlighted for how different versions tried to translate this word exploited. The NRSV says, God, Jesus, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. The ESV says, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. The NIV says, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Is that Greek word, harpagmos, starting to make sense? Do you see why Jeff Spencer and I and Pastor Janet picked a picture of a grasping, clawing hand? This Greek word really hints at some things. Think about grasping, clawing, seizing violently. What this Christ hymn tells us is radicalness. God became human, took on a form, decided to move into the neighborhood, decided to be an example for us and die on the cross for us, but in that did not exploit, use, or take the privilege that God could have had on this planet. Jesus didn't show up and scream at everybody with the powerful lungs of an almighty God, on your knees, worship me. He watched out for the marginalized. He talked to anybody that came into his path. He was radical and actually told people they were forgiven and healed. I, I gotta tell you, I'm not real excited about religion and practices for the sake of practices and rules for the sake of rules. But when I got really excited about Jesus Christ when I was 18 years old, it was the example of Jesus Christ and what it means to follow a God that isn't out to use every one of us to God's own advantage. When you hear this Christ hymn, you start to realize that God gave everything up and did not use the strength that God had. The creator of the world, the one who made all the universes, showed up and basically said, I'm going to suffer with you. I'm going to lay down my life with you. And I got to tell you, at 18 to 48, that's the Jesus Christ that I'm into and want to follow. Every time I hear this, have the same mind that Christ Jesus had, I'm like, oh, wow, I got a lot to work on. Let me give you some examples. Coming up here, remember I mentioned that there is a, a Good Friday, and then you also have Easter. There's a Sunday before Good Friday and Easter, and it is called? Oh, very good. It's called Palm Sunday. Here is a perfect example of how Christ was not a grasper, was not violently seizing, was not scraping and clawing. Uh, there was a tradition at the time period of Jesus that if you were a military general, if you were out to slash and ruin and take people over, uh, you basically would do that with military might. What's really interesting about that Greek word that I told you, that harpagmos, is that it was used with Alexander the Great. That Greek word was used. That's how he won. That's how he conquered. That's how he destroyed. And so when you think about Palm Sunday, if a ruler wanted to come into town, they'd actually do it on a big and powerful horse. Uh, imagine this painting, this really uh, famous painting. Imagine a Napoleon coming into town with a big, big horse, and everybody claims that he was short, but Jeff Spencer knows everything. He told me that the truth is they've discovered that Napoleon was about 5'6", five, 5'7", five, and that's my height, so I think he was pretty tall. Uh, and uh, imagine coming into Jerusalem on a powerful horse. Uh, I thought I'd broaden it a little bit. Wonder Woman on this stallion, this beautiful black horse. Some of you are thinking about about different superheroes and stuff and I don't even know anything about it Assassin's Creed and and everything you got all these when you think about strength and power uh, wait a second Jesus is the son of God shouldn't he have ridden into town on a mighty war horse if we were to go to 2019 I was looking at photos because I told you I'm, I'm visual when I preach I see things and and I just typed in tank and, and this military tank came up. And I was thinking of World War II pictures like the General Montgomery from Britain. And this British tank came up. And I was like, 
You know, if, if we were to write scripture or superhero-ness like we would write it, we might have Christ roll into L.A. in a tank so he could get rid of all the evil and smash all the things that are wrong. I was recently really impacted by uh, Captain Marvel when Gwen Stefani is singing uh, I'm Just a Girl and she was just kicking butt everywhere, you know, and I was like, man, she's my superhero, right? Uh, take the power and the strength of what you and I think we should deal with brokenness and flip that completely upside down and Christ came and absolutely laid down his life. Uh, let me mention Adam and Eve to you in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. Do you know you and I are from a long line of graspers, <laughs> scratchers, seizing things for their own opportunity? And Genesis chapter 3 through 5, our family tree is that Adam and Eve eventually wanted to be just like God. Being who they were created to be wasn't enough. They wanted more power. And part of this passage for me is really moving me to be reminded, God, if I am going to be in your image, if I'm going to have the mind of Christ, what does it not mean to lead with strength, with seizing, with grasping, with using my advantage, with misusing privilege? But what does it mean to be like Christ? I want you guys to hear this scripture done again in both spoken word as well as the little scripture itself and maybe this time you'll hear it even more powerfully imagining Christ not using strength but laying down all his power for us. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being born in human likeness and found in human form. He walked among us, teaching us, how our lives could be transformed, healing and miracles he performed, but many were not willing to conform yet. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because all of us were lost, redemption is what Christ brought, but the loss of our God's son is what it cost. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. Jesus Christ, the King, at the right hand of the Father he reigns. So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We sing, sing together, together to, to praise, praise his name. name. Amen. Amen. I hope you're starting to catch how radical this hymn is. God, through the Son of God, through Jesus Christ, took on human form and didn't use power and strength to exploit humanity, didn't grasp for more and more, but instead, the word is emptied himself. Uh, can I put a couple of these verses up for you again and read them? Verses seven and eight say, but he emptied himself. Wasn't forced to, didn't get tricked into it. God's nature chose to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Some translations say servant being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I'll give you a second uh, Greek word uh, that hopefully will stick in your mind for a really long time. And as you read this or you read the Christ hymn in Colossians chapter one, uh, the word is kenosis. 
And the best way to understand kenosis, you see a, another image there. There's a hand there. The first hand I showed you was that grabbing, clawing, reaching, wanting to exploit others for their own benefit. This is a passive hand, a sacrificial hand. Kenosis is to empty oneself. And that's what Christ did for us. Self-emptying, nature of a servant, humbled himself. As you guys get ready to head towards Easter, I want to bring up that, that Palm Sunday example again. I told you if we were writing the storyline or we thought God was aggressive and wanted to basically get us all to bow down through force and might that Jesus probably should have ridden into Jerusalem in a tank, I want to now remind you, or if you've never heard it before, how beautiful would this be if you hear it for the first time? In the Gospels, Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem and they all hailed him king and he was riding a donkey. The son of God, the creator of the universe on a smelly, slow-paced, barely fits on top of donkey. I don't know if you've ever seen a donkey. I, I, I like a big thoroughbred or a stallion. I mean, if I'm going to ride on something, I'm like Napoleon. I need to get up high, right? I want to show people high and mighty. But Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. There's some Hebrew Old Testament understanding that when a king would ride into a town on a donkey, it meant that they were coming in peace. If you came in on a war horse, you were coming ready to destroy, kill, and ruin. But if you came in on a donkey, you were coming in ready for peace. The, the best illustration I could come up with today, instead of a tank, if Jesus were coming into LA, maybe he'd be in a VW bug, and I don't know, maybe he'd have a big old peace sign somewhere, and, and maybe there would be this emphasis of, remember, I come to save and not force you to love me. I come to lay it all down for you. When you guys think about following Jesus instead of being a fan, but being a follower, do you like the concept of the VW bus or do you like the concept of the tank? When you think about Jesus riding into town on a donkey, do you understand that our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ emptied himself, became a servant, became a slave for our sakes so that we wouldn't use privilege, we wouldn't use might, we wouldn't use manipulation Remember, we're all in a long line of graspers, of manipulators. We're all in a long line of watching out for numero uno, all the way from Adam and the Eve to every single one of our family trees. I gotta tell you, when I read this hymn, it continues to remind me of why I wanna follow Jesus. He doesn't force or demand my loyalty. He doesn't shame me and call out over and over again, you're a manipulator, you're a power monger, you're a grasper, you're violent, you have no chance to be with me. He says, come to me. You're exhausted, you're overwhelmed. I can save you. I can make you who you were intended to be from the very beginning. This Christ hymn, for me, represents everything that Jesus Christ can do in me that I can't do on my own. I've been following Christ since I was 18 years old, and man, God has brought me a long way, and there's a lot more that Christ wants to do. I'm sad this is the last university passage because we probably should have spent 12 chapels on it. But will you, every time you hear Philippians, remember that the God of all creation with all the power in the world did not come here and demand our loyalty, our worship, but showed up and laid down his life, even death on a cross. In two and a half weeks, you guys will be in the middle of Holy Week. And I hope you won't just be a casual fan of Jesus or an occasional stop in. Hey, Jesus, I just remembered you again today. I hope you will be a follower. 
And in being a follower, each of us has privilege of some kind. Many of us have more of it than we even know. And what was it like to be reminded of the example of Christ and to lay that down and serve others in order to have the mind of Christ? I want you to hear this hymn one more time. Listen to what Christ wasn't and listen to what Christ was and be reminded that we have been invited into this type of life. Listen to the Christ hymn one more time. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He walked among us, teaching us how our lives could be transformed, healing and miracles he performed but many were not willing to conform yet. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because all of us were lost. Redemption is what Christ brought, but the loss of our God's son is what it cost. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. Jesus Christ, the King, at the right hand of the Father, he reigns. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We, we sing, sing together, together to, to praise, praise his, his name. name. Amen. APU, have the mind of Christ. APU, if you don't know this one named Jesus, there's a lot of people around here that would love to introduce you. APU, if you want real life, it's in Jesus Christ. I got this song, I'm an old man, and I end up uh, hitting uh, repeat over and over again, but it has some sweet lyrics, and as you walk out of here, you're gonna hear it, but listen to these sweet lyrics based on Jesus. He is beauty for the blind man, riches for the poor. He is friendship for the one the world ignores. He is safety for the weary, rest for those who strive. So come and be chainless, come and be fearless, come to the foot of Calgary. APU, live in the freedom of Christ, amen. <laughs> 